Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for hearing reports of those 34 salvations. We thank you for uh, that we were able to take part and just minister so that those people came to know you as Savior. I pray that the efforts of all the different men and women going down there from all the different communities would continue to make positive impact in that community. Heavenly Father, we pray now that as we turn to your word that you might inspire us, remind us of who you are, how we can respond to you, and what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to 1 Samuel. We'll be in chapter 5. If you're someone who looks at the bulletin, you'll see that we have a lot of ground to cover this morning. I'm going to read uh, some of the scripture for you, part of the scripture. I'm just going to paraphrase. But this is one of the stories in the Bible that is an amazingly interesting story. And it's a wild story. And it's one we don't look at much. But it is just a fascinating bit of, of the history of the Ark of the Covenant and its travels. We're in the middle of a series we've been looking at. It's sort of, we've started out looking at Hannah and her prayer for a child. We've been looking at the, the uh, progress of Israel at the last days of the time of the judges, looking towards the establishment of a, of a kingdom for Israel. We've been reading about the people. We've been reading about their struggles. We've been reading about their sins. And today we're going to look at what happened after we looked at last week when the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. The Philistines were a group of people who for a long time had been at war with Israel. They, at this point in the story that we've been looking at, the Philistines captured the Ark. And the people were in great mourning because the glory of the Lord had departed from Israel. But the language captive gives a little bit of a, what I think is a, a, a poor description of what happened. If you look at the story today, what we're going to look at, you see that God was always in control. It wasn't merely the Philistines had happened to win the battle. It's that God had chosen to remove himself and place himself in this location. Because even in our story, he is in complete control. What we're looking at today is a spiritual battle won by the Lord. It's one that I hope that we can remember that no matter the heartache, no matter the struggle, no matter the situation that we are in, God wins the victory. Look with me now at 1 Samuel chapter 5, starting in verse 1. When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. Now Dagon was the god of the Philistines. It was a water deity. It looked kind of like a merman. It was half fish, half man. And they, these Philistines were sort of known as the people of the sea. And so they had this great deity. Now, whenever uh, the Philistines went to battle with Israel, it wasn't just the Philistines battling Israel. It was Dagon versus Yahweh. Whichever per group won, it wasn't just that the people won. It was seen that their deity was greater than the other people's deity. So they take the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in the temple of Dagon as a victory. Look what we've captured. Isn't Dagon great? Look, we, we pulverized Israel, and now we have the Ark of the Covenant, and we are going to put it as an offering to our God, Dagon. What a great day it must have been for the priests of Dagon and their celebrations. But the celebration doesn't last long. Look at verse 3. And, the next, and when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold... Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. Oh, Dagon had fallen. This was a statue. Okay, this was probably a large statue. The priests come in, they come into the room, and Dagon is laying down face first in front of the altar. What a sight. Look at what happened there. Just, just think of, of God in the middle of the night, that's how I picture it, taking if you will, that statue and laying it down in front of the altar. And one thing I want to be very clear about here, it is not that God and Dagon had in themselves a spiritual battle, for there is no Dagon. It's not as if our great God Yahweh went to, went to some sort of battle with this lower deity, Dagon. Dagon is a lie. If anything, we could say that the, the power of Satan had been in the people and led them astray to follow after this 
false deity, but even that is a lie. The devil is merely a fallen angel who deceives. So there wasn't any great battle for, in that sense, it was God coming in and trying to say to the Philistines, I am not going to rest in the presence of your false deity. If anything, what you understand as Dagon is going to bow before Yahweh. The people, continuing in verse 4, so they took Dagon and put him back in his place. Even that's got to gotta hurt those priests. Why couldn't their own deity, Dagon, stand up the statue? But they didn't. They rush in. They stand the statue up and put it back up in this place so that they can continue their celebrations. Verse 4. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Again, it happens. And this time it's worse. Not only is he laying face first in front of the altar, his head's been cut off, his hands have been cut off, his torso is broken off, and just laying there in front of the ark of God. What insult to this perceived deity of Dagon. The Philistine priests were so celebratory. Yay, we captured the ark. Oh, Dagon's laying down. Let's pick him back up. Oh, they go on the next day and his head's cut off. I mean, and hands cut off. He can't do anything. He can't speak anything. He can't know what's going on. Dagon is dead in the presence of Yahweh. Yeah, amen. So the priests, rather than say, look at what has happened here. Look at what this God of Yahweh has set before us, an example of his power and might in our own temple to Dagon. What they do is they say, from this day forward, if you will, in verse 5, this is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. They just say, Dagon, Dagon is sick. You, you can't go in there. Or maybe they say, Dagon is too holy. You can't go in there. They don't even let the people come in and see what has happened. They shut the door, they close the curtains, and they say, you know what? You can't come in here today. It's too amazing to come into the presence of Dagon. Too much has happened. They set up some religious mumbo-jumbo to keep the people from seeing the power and might of Yahweh. Here's the thing about Yahweh. Here's the thing about God. Here's the thing we need to remember about Christ himself. His glory is not going to stay hidden. As Buddy mentioned with the children, the, the glory of God shone forth so the disciples knew who he was. Today, the glory of Christ will not remain hidden in our lives and the lives of the world around us. He is going to be shown and his glory is going to be revealed. But for the Philistines... They try to shut it down, which is an amazing thing to think about because they believed that their Dagon was real, and they believed that Yahweh was real. But rather than concede to the victory that took place in that threshold, in that temple of Dagon, they try to hide it. So God has a stronger message for the Philistines. Verse 6, The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, or Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? They answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark to, of God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought around to us the ark of God of Israel to kill us and our people. So they therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistine and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place for it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Do you see what God is doing here? 
God is going, being sent from place to place. They're playing hot potato with the ark of God. Oh, I don't want it, you take it. Oh, we don't want it, you take it. Why would you give it to us? We don't want it. This great symbol of the victory of the Philistines is now being pushed and shoved from city to city because God is being heavy on the people. Now, the language here tends, leads a little bit to mystery. Some of you in, who are looking in your King James this morning, it may have the word emeralds or, or even hemorrhoids. Some people think that the tumors that God afflicted the people with were hemorrhoids. And such a bad case that the people were dying. We can't say that exclusively or, or, or 100% accurately. It could just be tumors of some sort. But these were deadly. If you, as we continue our story, as we have time today, you'll also find out that there were mice and rats in the land. So some people think that what the Philistines were experiencing was the bubonic plague in their day. But rather than repent, Rather than say, God's hand is mighty upon us, Yahweh is bringing judgment upon us, we should, we should forget Dagon, we should turn our eyes away from Dagon, we should worship Yahweh, because look at how powerful and strong he is. They said, we don't want him, you take him. We don't want him, you take him. They said, we don't want him, he's killing us. They completely ignored the power of God and the, the presence of God and the conviction of God and just tried to send God away. Now let's be honest, even though there, we're Christians, most of us in this place today, there have been times when we've responded to God in the exact same fashion. There's sin in our lives, there's something we know that God is calling us to do and we don't want to do it, so God's hand is heavy upon us, perhaps not in an affliction sense, but in a conviction sense. And, and instead of listening to God and doing what God says, we push God away. Maybe we are in a state where God is sending some great sense into us because we are worshiping something other than God. So what Matthew, we don't worship other things than God. We're Americans. We don't do that in our day. Sure we do. Sure we do. We have idols in our day. Popularity. Money. Money's won throughout the ages. A lot of us, we're not content. We do not feel safe. We do not feel at peace unless we have a certain amount of money in the bank. So tell me where your faith is. Some of us, it's our health. If we aren't healthy, we aren't happy. Or some of us, it's happiness. If I don't feel good, something's wrong. I need to do this to make myself feel happy. I need to, to spend money on this to make myself happy. I need to be with this person to make myself happy. And perhaps there's times in your lives where God has stripped away that thing that you were relying so much on. A relationship crumbled because all your faith had been in that relationship. Your car breaks down. There's a, so, something wrong with your house and, and your money, that financial security that you've been resting on has been stripped away. Or you've worked and you've eaten right and you tried to exercise and you tried to do everything right and you put all your pride in what you've been able to do to stay healthy and you're stricken with some disease. Now, I'm not saying that God... Is anybody who's sick, God's trying to, to get you because you've been prideful or boastful. But I am saying that if we are putting our reliance on something other than God, it should not surprise us when God comes in and knocks it down. He did it in the lives of Dagon. He did it for those people. Let us not be surprised when we turn our attention away from God or when we try to push Him away and God says, no, you are not going to ignore me, and He gets our attention. The Philistines pushed him away and pushed him away and pushed him away rather than saying, we've been wrong. We've been worshiping a deity that can't even stand up in his own temple. We should turn our attention and follow after this God. They don't. Let me paraphrase the story now. They decide they're going to send away the Ark of the Covenant. What they're going to do is they're going to build a a cart, they're going to put the Ark of the Covenant on it, they're going to put two oxen in front of it, and they say, just let it go. Just let it go, and wherever it goes, it's good. If it goes back to Israel, we'll know that, uh, that Yahweh is best, or is greater, and it'll go, or if it stays in our region, then we'll know that Dagon still is in charge. They said, don't just send it away, though. These are the priests and the wise men of the Philistines. They say, don't just send it away. You need to put a guilt offering with it. And a guilt offering was something that was an acknowledgement of wrong, and in this, in this 
culture of the day, you, you made the guilt offering representative of whatever your guilt was being brought about or however it was being symbolized. So for the people, they made golden tumors. They may have made golden hemorrhoids. I don't know. Don't know quite, quite what that would have looked like, but they made golden tumors, and they made golden mice. They made five golden tumors to represent the five cities of, of uh, the Philistines, and they made enough mice to represent all the different cities uh, and the towns and providence, provinces and s put them with the Ark of God. The Ark of God followed by the two oxen, they go back to the land of the Israelites. If you look on the map you got up, we've got up, or we will have up. I sprung it on you, sorry Gary, or whoever's up there. You can see this is sort of the path that it took. Last week we looked at how it went from Shiloh to uh, Aphek, and that's where the battle occurred. That's when the Philistines captured it. It travels all the way down to Ashdod. That's where the temple was for Dagon. They didn't want it. They sent it to Gath. Gath didn't want it. They sent it to Ekron. Ekron says, we don't want it. Let's send it back. It had been in the land, of the green land of the Philistines for seven months. They had been enjoying death and, and tumors. And as we find out now, these rats, they say, we can't take this conviction any longer. We can't take these death any longer. So they send it back to Israel. It goes to Beth Shemesh. At Beth Shemesh, they offer an offering to the Lord. They use the, the oxen that were sent, which um, they, they consecrate it to the Lord. But then even at that point, even at that point, something... I'm going to use the word crazy because I'm just lacking the right word. Some people of Israel, they decide, as best as I can figure, they decide they're going to take a little peek and find out what's going on inside the Ark of the Covenant. And on that day, after they've consecrated an offering to the Lord, this is, if you have your Bible open, you can look in 1 Samuel 6. Uh, we'll be in verse 18. This is where we pick up, it says, And the golden mice, according to the number of the city of the Philistines, belonging to the five lords. This probably won't be on the screen. It might just be in your Bibles if you look there. Um, it says that the great stone beside which they set down the ark of the Lord is a witness of this day in the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh. And he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them. And the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up away from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of, of Kirath, uh, uh, Jerem saying the Philistines have returned the ark of the Lord come down and take it up to you see even when it comes back into the land of Israel the Israelites do not respond properly and according to what God had told them they respond improperly to God they try to, to look upon it or take a peek inside of it and 70 men of Israel are killed that day to us we don't get that that seems so absurd, so hard, so cruel of God for his own people. All they wanted to do was take a little look. But God has told the people how they are to stand and respect the Lord. So they disobey God. And we've been looking at some of this on, on Wednesday nights also. God to set an example and to say, I will be treated worshipfully. You will deal with me as I have asked you to do strikes them dead and even they say we need to send the Lord away from here who can stay in the presence of God here so they send them away they send the ark of the Lord on to Kirith Jerem Kirith Jerem was a place where there was some lineage of, of priests and some lineage of the people who were to take care of the ark and the Levites so perhaps that's why they sent it there. When I read the story, I was curious why they didn't send it back up to Shiloh, which is where the place of worship was. We're not told. We're not told. It goes to the city of Kirith Jerem, and 40 years later, it finds its way to Jerusalem, which uh, was set up as the, the center for Israel. So they go to Gath, it gets pushed away, it gets pushed away, it gets pushed away. It comes back to Israel, they treat God improperly. It's pushed a little bit farther, a little bit more secure, but away from the people 
who have been brought under the conviction of God. But in all this time, in all the scenarios, one thing I want to point out is not simply the conviction of God, but it is the power and presence of God. In the temple, there was no victory for Dagon. Even when God was standing in the presence, if you will, of Dagon, though there was no real presence, but there was no real Dagon, God was victorious. God was in authority. As he traveled around the Philistine land, he was in control and convicting the people and displaying his might and his radiance. And for us, as we look towards Easter, we need to remember that even on the cross, even when the moment of weakness, when, when the world looked at Christ and saw a victory for the world and the destruction of Christ, even that was a different sort of victory for us. Not for, not for the people who tried to tear Christ down and, and slander and mock him and kill him, even in that moment of what some of the religious leaders of Israel saw as a great victory in destroying this false prophet of Christ, who was Christ, even that moment, Christ was in control. <coughs> if you have your Bibles, turn with me very quickly to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 14 through 18 reads, And I, the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back up again. This charge I have received from my Father. The authority that we see displayed in that, that, threshing, that threshold of Dagon between Yahweh and this false deity, we see victory in the Lord. On this day, when we look at John and the story of John, we see Christ saying, I am the good shepherd, and I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep, not because they have authority over me, not because they're pressuring me, not because they're more powerful than me, not because there's more of them than me. I have total authority to do this, and I'm going to do this because I am the good shepherd. I do this for my sheep. He lays down his life for us. Christ wasn't tricked upon the cross. Christ wasn't captured and forced upon the cross. He had all the authority to lay his life down. He had all the authority to take it back up again. We serve a Christ who has authority and he is going to display it. My question is, have you come to the place in your own life where you have acknowledged that authority? Or are you still pushing away, pushing away, pushing away Christ has it have you come to the point in your life to realize it and to allow him to be in control of your life for some of you you're here today and I'm so thankful that you're here today but in your life you God has been a presence in your life but rather than respond and, and, and turn your life around you've put up a barrier and you've tried to push God away. And maybe you felt conviction, or maybe God has been dealing with you, or maybe there's some calamity in your life, and you can't fully understand why it's there. And rather than turn to God, you're still turning away. Even the Philistines said, let's, let's send a guilt offering. Let's acknowledge and let, let's deal with this. For many of us, we don't deal with it, and God continues to, to, to be this presence in our lives that we're trying to push away. It's time to stop pushing. It's time to stop rejecting. It's time to st stop hiding. It's time to surrender. It's time to open your life up to that call of God who said, I love you, and he is calling for you, and his sheep are going to know his voice. Do you hear him calling you this morning? 
He said to the people of Israel, they are sheep, not of this flock. We think about that as us today. Through generation after generation after generation, from the people of Israel to the, to the Gentiles, to all of us, we are still responding to that call. So we're all a part of this, this family together, this flock, if you will, for the good shepherd who is in authority, who had the authority to lay us down, down his life and the authority to take it back up. Have you responded to that today? Or are you still pushing? Pushing God away didn't work well for the Philistines. It's not going to work well for you either. Decide today to listen to that call of Christ in your life. Christian, you who are already a believer, we still sometimes push God away. It's time to listen. It's time to obey Him. It's time to follow Him so that His glory can radiate through us. And it can just be displayed to the world. But that's going to happen when we stop pushing. Start accepting what God calls us to do. Maybe today God is calling you to say, it's time. It's time. You felt the conviction. You felt the weight. You know that what you're doing in your life is wrong. You know there's sin in your life. And you're finally ready to stop pushing away from God. Come down front. This altar is open. Pray about those things. Let's, let's go full, full blown with it and let's talk about salvation. Come down front. Let's talk about what it means to know the Savior. To give your life over to Him. To become a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'll be down front to talk to you. This altar is open. But take time today to be in the presence of He who has authority. And rather than push, receive what He is calling you to do. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, this ark in that quiet temple for that false deity was in complete authority. For the people of Israel, you laid it down. You tore down that altar. God, I pray for the people in this room who are following after things, anything other than you. Happiness, wealth, money, pleasure, attention, fear, pride, whatever it is. God, you speak to us lovingly, you speak to us graciously, but we also see occasions you come in and you tear things down. Is your life in a state right now where you feel like God is trying to reach you not through just His loving voice, but through His conviction? You need to answer to that. Don't be surprised when all those little idols you've erected crumble. Don't push God away. Acknowledge Him. And this Christ who laid down his life and took it up again, as he speaks to you today, as he speaks to you about those sins, as he speaks to you about those things that you're doing, as he lays conviction upon you, don't push him away. That's the natural inclination for us. We're prideful people. We want to get rid of any conviction. We want to get rid of any feeling of discomfort. Don't do it. Hear him and respond to him as he leads. Let that conviction turn into conversion through repentance. Say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me, dear Lord. Do it today. In Jesus' name we pray.